That's a, how's that for an entrance? <laughs> and we had light in here, you know, what do you think about that? Hey, I'd like to welcome you here this morning. I'd like to welcome those uh, who are online, those who uh, may be in the car this morning, and you here in the auditorium. And as you can tell, we're getting ready for Bible school. At, uh, that's the big event. It starts tomorrow night at uh, 6 o'clock. And uh, you say, what's your job? I, everybody's a taxi now or an Uber driver. Oh, got to be Uber driver. How's that? So, so, but don't charge them. Just bring them, okay? And we try to fill the place with kids. I appreciate all the work that's been done this week setting up the church. It'll be a fun, exciting week. We look forward to that. I have just a few announcements. Uh, I do have announcements. Calvary Baptist Church in Clinton is looking for volunteers to help with their uh, Bible school August 9th. 13th from 10 to 12 so that's a morning bible school and so if you're interested see carla they could uh, use some help there also operation christmas child uh, we continue to uh, collect for shoe boxes for operation christmas child and uh, we do need uh, school supplies we've got plenty of pencils we need things like papers erasers and sharpeners uh for uh, for uh for uh, kids' school supplies. So if you could bring, start bringing those, as many as you can, as we get ready for this fall for Operation Christmas Child. Uh, also, uh, let's see. Uh, that's all my announcements, I guess. Uh, Brother Doc's going to come, and he's going to lead us in prayer this morning as we begin thinking about our missions. We're glad to see you here today, and uh, we're going to have a good time worshiping the Lord today. Amen? Amen. To our senior deacon here. Okay. Yeah. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. In 1 Chronicles 4.10 is the prayer of Jabez. He says, enlarge my borders and keep me safe. And then in 2 Chronicles 7.14, you probably heard that one. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, then I'll hear, Father, as we come to you today, help us to humble ourselves. We ask you to forgive us of our iniquities. We ask, Father, that you rise up leaders, that you save our nation. Father, we're further away than we think we are. We're in bad straits. People who care not have taken over. They're now taking away our privileges as a Christian. We pray that we gather together, we humble ourselves, and we reach out. Father, I'm making a challenge this morning that each of us Find someone in our family, someone in, in our neighborhood that does not know you, does not come to church, that we compel them to come and we fill the house. Father, the word is here. It's being provided, but we need listeners we need to save our families, our community, our nation. And so we ask for that. And while we're doing that, Father, continue to lead us, continue to bless us. We thank you for our pastors, their ability to present the word. We thank you for the deacons, and we thank you for the musicians. We're just so privileged to be able to gather together where they can't do that so much in the world. Uh, I read the voice of the martyrs where so many people are giving their lives to just save, serve Christ. Father, we know that it is a wicked world and you're in it leading us through it. We thank you for your power, for your compassion, and for your love. 
help us to exhibit that to those around about us. Help us to share your word and encourage others to get into it and read it. How beautiful it is, how peaceful it is, Lord, just to sit and read your word. So we ask for your guidance and for your power and for your blessing. Thank you for this church and for all that have labored in it and has stood for you and that you have helped us. We don't realize just how blessed we are to have a God who loves us like you do. But help us to reach those that don't know you and to share that word. So I challenge us, Father, that we reach out and we fill this house full of people and teach them about you and about the love that you have for the people that you have uh, brought into this world. We know you love them. You died for them. Thank you for all of that. And this, we ask, Father, that you be with the Vacation Bible School coming up this week. Bless the children, bless the leaders. Use them to present your word, to hide it in their hearts, to be merciful to others. And we'll give you the praise in the Lord and the glory in the Lord. Amen. Hebrews 9.22 says, In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It takes blood to save us from our sinful nature. The Old Testament was setting the table for the greater sacrifice that Jesus Christ did on the cross by shedding his blood. And that's why we come here every Saturday, or every Saturday, every Sunday morning, to bless that wonderful name, to praise that wonderful name, to go out so we can share that wonderful name. That is why Jesus Christ is the name above all names. And that's why we're here. And so let's st uh, st stand and sing to that. Let's praise that wonderful name.
brought your son Jesus Christ down to atone for our sins and Lord we are just so grateful for that we love giving you the glory for that because we know that between, by ourselves we cannot do it alone Father we pray that anybody here that does not know you can realize the fact today that their sinful nature keeps you away, keeps them away from you and Lord that your son Jesus Christ brings us right back Father we thank you for this time in which we can gather Lord and we just pray for Pastor Roger and his message this morning Speak through him. Use his words and your words to reach that lost soul. Father, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
focus on Jesus Christ. Of course, last uh, series was a focus on Jesus, but it uh, it was filled with a lot of drama. What do y'all think? And uh, but it's for our instruction. But this morning we're in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, we're going to the uh, first chapter, uh, verses uh, one through thirteen. So if you turn your Bibles there, uh, Mark chapter uh, one. Verse 113, my note says Mark chapter 12. I hope that's not on the slide this morning as we go there. But let's all stand as we read the first uh, 13 verses there of the book of Mark. It says in the first verse, it says this. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. And all the country of Judea and all of Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I. The strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and a spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased." The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Let's pray. Lord, I pray the blessing upon your uh, word this morning, and we are reminded as uh, Brother Adam is uh, down at Madison preaching this morning, uh, uh, Lord, I pray that you'll help him as he speaks, that you'll guide his words. And Lord, as we turn our attention here to Mark, uh, Lord, we pray that you uh, give us insight, that you teach us, open our uh, spiritual ears, clarity of thought. And Lord, may we understand and respond in a way to this message that honors you. In Jesus' name, amen. As we look at the Gospel of Mark, the shortest gospel in the Bible, uh, they're all there for a purpose. I remember the young lady several years ago uh, uh, when she went on her first date, she took a Bible with us and laid it between her and her date in the car. And, and he said, what's that for? He said, in case you got any ideas, you have to crawl across Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So, but anyway, you older people remember that. You younger guys say, what in the world is he talking about? But anyway, uh, Mark uh, presents Jesus as the servant uh, who came to give his life a ransom for many. Uh, 37% of this book is devoted to the events of his last month, of Christ's last month, uh, and his important uh, Passion Week. Uh, the date of the book of Mark is somewhere between 55 and 65 A.D., they believe, because Mark mentions the temple in the present tense, that the temple's there, so uh, many would believe that that means that uh, the temple had not been destroyed, or Mark would have said, you know, there, there was the former temple. He mentions there is a temple uh, in Jerusalem. Um, and early traditions disagree as to whether it was written before or after the martyrdom of Peter, uh, which was around 64 A.D. Uh, so we got about the right date, give or take uh, a few years here. But early uh, thoughts uh, believe that Mark originated in Rome and was written from Rome and directed toward Romans. Uh, it's not a biography like some of the other Gospels. It's more of a topical. If you notice it, it kind of jumps around fast pace following the life of Christ because Christ is going somewhere in Mark. He's going to the cross. And it's a, it's a, it's a story about uh, the life of Christ, uh, the topical things in Christ's life as he heads toward the cross. If you'd say, is there a key verse in Mark? Uh, uh, chapter 10, verse 43 and 45 says, uh, But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slaves of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So the idea here is Jesus came to serve, not to be served, and give his life a ransom uh, for many. Um, there seems to be a break in Mark uh, about chapter uh, uh, 8 
where when once Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, uh, Christ turns and starts preparing the disciples for his death. Up until that time, uh, we find that he's trying to get him to understand the gospel and what it's all about. About halfway through there, he changes and starts preparing the disciples for his approaching death. Uh, of course, who's the author? Uh, it's not clear uh, who the author is, uh, but most would point out the uh, majority of uh, scholars through the years believe it was John Mark. Uh, there's no other Mark that we know of in the Bible that would, would fit that uh, idea. Even uh, Irenaeus uh, from the 2nd century uh, said Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, also himself handed on in, uh, handled on in writing the things that had been preached by Peter. So the idea is that John Mark was with Peter, and Peter had a first-hand account of the life of Christ, uh, apostolic uh, authority. And Mark was with Peter, and therefore Mark is putting in writing uh, a gospel which was uh, taught to him uh, by Peter. Okay, and Of course, we know it's given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that's, that's speaking uh, through uh, John Mark here. If it is John Mark, which we believe it is. But we know also that the authority of the gospel, the, the apostolic uh, teaching, comes by an apostle. An apostle has seen Christ, has been with Christ. You take of all the other Gospels, uh, these men uh, uh, were, were servants like Luke uh, was uh, with Paul and following the, uh, the apostles around. So they had first-hand account of the things that happened of the life of Christ. And so we find here uh, the setting in Rome at this time is very, uh, very dangerous. Because in, between 60 and 70 A.D., uh, Nero, who ruled responsibly from 54 to 59 A.D., uh, did fine. But then all of a sudden, he started uh, being a, a, a tyrant uh, concerning the rich people. Uh, he heavily taxed their estates. Uh, uh, he made false accusations. He even invited people to, have, to public suicide at his banquets. Now, if Nero uh, says, why don't you kill yourself... Uh, that means you better kill yourself or someone else is going to kill yourself. You guys follow me this morning? Nero was a dictator. He was a, a wicked man, okay? Uh, but in the summer of AD 64, a fire swept through, the Roman imp or through Rome, and it destroyed uh, uh, all but three of the city wards. It seriously, uh, I mean, just like a big Chicago fire. And the, after the initial shock, people was rumoring that maybe this fire was caused by uh, the government. Uh, conspiracy by Nero. Uh, and Nero immediately began a program of urban renewal. Huh, I've got to clear places out so we can start building new stuff, you know. Does that sound familiar? Okay. Anyway, the, the rumors were going around, and even though Nero tried a new public building, new parks, new construction of fireproof materials, brick and stone, because their old Roman burnt, there was still this suspicion that Nero had something to do with it. He had to find a scapegoat. So you know what he did? He blamed it on those Christians. Uh, uh, Tacitus, or Tacitus, however you pronounce his name, uh, he writes, he writes, Nero had self-acknowledged Christians arrested. Then on their information, large numbers of others were condemned for their antisocial tendencies. Their deaths were uh, farcical, dressed in animal skins. They were torn to pieces by dogs or crucified or made into torches to be ignited after dark. We're talking about Christians now. Made into torches to light them after dark as substitutes for daylight. Nero provided his gardens for the spectacle, stood on his chariots. Despite the guilt as Christians and the ruthless punishment it deserved, the victims were pitied by the Roman people. But this tells you what was happening in Rome about this time, Christians were being put in animal skins and allowed wild animals to eat them, to chew on them, or they were dressed in uh, coats of wax and lit as candles in his garden. People, Christians. Okay, so there was a terrible uh, persecution going on. They were even uh, putting them in the out where the wild beasts, you know, in the in the arenas uh, where they'd be attacked. Matter of fact, if you notice in our text this morning, we talk about. Uh, Mark talks about Jesus in the wilderness where the wild beasts are. That was in our text this morning. 
why does Mark mention the wild beasts being in the wilderness? No other gospel mentions that. But it brings out the fact that there are wild beasts in the wilderness. Evidently, uh, these people to whom is this uh, uh, gospel is being written uh, perhaps are being persecuted by their being allowed wild beasts to attack them. You with me this morning? You see, you see the background here. And uh, so Mark here, uh, his task was to project the Christian faith in a context of suffering and martyrdom. They were suffering. And remember I told you, uh, it's believed that Peter, this is not in the Bible, but it's extra sources, believe Peter was martyred around 64 A.D. in Rome, and that's the time Nero was doing this horrendous persecution. If you look at the next slide about the dating of Mark, if that's the next slide, Brother Mike, you can kind of see uh, the timeline. You really can't see it very well from where you're at, but Jesus is born about 5 or 3 B.C. Uh, we think it's zero, but anyway, uh, we see uh, John baptized Jesus about 28 to 33 A.D., and uh, Mark writes this gospel between 60, that says 85, but really it's more between around 60, 64. Some believe it was before the martyrdom of Peter. It could very well have been after the martyrdom of Peter, because what's happening here, it could be that Peter is, is killed, and now Mark is writing down the gospel that Peter preached, so people would have it as a record. So we would have it as a record, and that to me is more plausible than anything else that's happening here. Uh, but the Christians in Rome were living in a wilderness. It was a hostile place to be. That's why Mark opens his gospel with a superscription, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's how he opens his up this morning. The beginning of the gospel. Now, the word beginning is RK, and it can mean first in order of a temporal sequence, or it could be uh, first in terms of origin, like in the beginning, God. Okay, first in terms of origin. Okay, in the beginning, God. And what he's talking about, in the beginning, uh, uh, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's not just the phrase we're talking about this morning or the chapter. He's talking about the whole gospel. It's talking about the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he emphasized Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You notice the word, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel means good news, right? Not sad news. But did you know that in Greek language, the word uh, gospel uh, was a term used when reporting from the battlefield uh, that you won the victory. Okay. The gospel. Uh, the gospel from the battlefield. The good news from the battlefield. We won in the context of that is. There's a victory been won. And the people would rejoice to hear good news from the battlefield. Well the word gospel carries over into our meaning. The gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news is there's a victory from the battlefield. Jesus won the victory. And we look at Matthew. Uh, the focus of the Gospels, Matthew wrote primary for Jewish people. Okay, so he opens the book, his book, with a genealogy to prove that Christ is uh, in lineage to be the Messiah. Luke focuses mainly on the sympathetic ministry of the Son of Man. Okay, John uh, makes this opening statement about in the beginning was the Word in eternity. Uh, what does Mark do? He opens with a theme that Christ Jesus is a servant, the Son of God. And so... One of Mark's favorite uh, statements in the gospel is straight away or immediately. He uses it 41 times. And here's the idea, straight away or immediately. The idea is Jesus is going somewhere. He's not sitting around. Straight away or immediately, he's heading somewhere. He's going somewhere next. You say, where in the world he's going? Well, you know where he's going. He's going to the cross. Jesus came to serve, but straight away, immediately, 41 times, Mark uses that phrase, he's moving on to the next scene, to the next scene, to the next event, because it's going to cultivate with his death and resurrection. Uh, and so Christ is on his way, uh, has a purpose, has a mission. And interesting also this morning, as we uh, get a little bit closer to what we're getting into this morning, our text refers uh, this morning to the wilderness no less than four times. That word wilderness keeps coming down, uh, keeps coming up and refer to that in our opening verses. Today we will see the story of the gospel that begins in the wilderness and is good news for those who are in the wilderness. You ever feel like you're in a wilderness? You know, what's a wilderness? A wilderness is some place that's hostile, right? Rome was hostile to Christians at this time. 
And, and, and Mark begins by talking about the wilderness here. I imagine the Christians felt they were in the wilderness. Many of them lived in the catacombs underneath, catacombs underneath Rome. They were hiding because of persecution. Now, this did not take place for long periods of time, but it was intense in short periods of times. And they, they were in wilderness. And we find in Mark, it opens up by talking about these things happening in the wilderness. The first thing I want us to notice this morning is the story of the gospel. And when I say the story of the gospel, uh, Mark's gospel is uh, not so much a book, but it's the story of Jesus Christ, okay? It's the story. It's, it's, it's written so you'd know the, tell me the story of Jesus, you know, where Matthew and, and, and Luke, you know, those are more like books and John. Uh, Mark says more just a story. It's a story. You know, immediately, straight away, he moves from one point of the story to the next. And the story of the gospel begins with a cry from the wilderness. It says in the first verse, in the beginning of the gospel, this is a big thing, like in the beginning of God. In the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, that means pay attention, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare the way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. That's interesting. We're talking about John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ. Why is the cry coming from the wilderness? You ever wondered that? Well, remember, I just said it was a hostile environment in Rome. The people probably felt like they were in a wilderness. They felt like they were in an environment that wasn't comfortable. But when you think of the wilderness, remember the children of Israel, when they left the civilization of Egypt, when they left what was their modern world at the time, full of technology and all the comforts of home, where did they go? They went to the wilderness. They left the world as slaves. They were delivered from slavery, and they went to the wilderness. The wilderness was the, it was still God's domain. God still dwells in the wilderness. Amen? But it's away from the world. Away from the culture. Away from the philosophies. Away from the distractions. Okay. You guys have the problem in the world today. You want to get alone with God, you go out to where? Where you can be alone. A wilderness. Okay. The wilderness isn't all bad. And the voice of one crying uh, from the wilderness is a place where one is delivered from slavery. Okay? You think you're having fun in the world now. Uh, you need to get alone with God. Get alone in the wilderness of God and be delivered from sin because you're really a slave, but you don't know it till you get away from it. And you look back and you say, wow, I was a slave to that. Remember when Moses, he had the rod in his hand and, and God said, lay it down, you know, and Moses probably said, hey, nothing wrong with this rod. Why am I going to lay it down? God said, throw it down. He, Why should I do this? But God said, throw it down. And Moses threw it down, and it became a serpent. Remember? It became a serpent. A lot of times when God says, leave the world, get out in the wilderness, we do that, and we look back, and that what we was holding on to was really a serpent in our life. We didn't realize it. But then something else happened. God told Moses, this wasn't in my notes, so this is free, guys. God told Moses, he said, now pick it up. Wait, I laid a rod down, it becomes a serpent. And now you tell me to pick the snake up again? Yeah, pick it up by its tail, you know. Wait, wait, wait. Any of you guys that handle serpents, anyone here does that? Uh, no former members of any church? No, I'm just kidding. But, no. <laughs> You don't pick a serpent up by its tail because that leaves the business end open, okay? You know, you don't pick a serpent. You pick up a snake uh, behind him, by his head. Not his head, but Floyd knows. You've done that, haven't you, Floyd? Many times. he we give you a lecture. We do that. Snake handling next week, 101, okay? In Bible school, as we dig, we find snakes, okay? That's something new we add to the curriculum. But anyway, no, he picked the serpent up. And the Bible says it became a rod again. You say, what's the significance? Before that time in the Bible, that rod was called the rod of Moses. After that time, it became known as the rod of God. When Moses laid it down, said, okay, Lord, I'm giving it 
It's like, I'm giving it to you, Lord. I, it's not mine anymore. And God says, pick it up. Now it's God's ride. You know, a lot of times God wants us to go to the wilderness to lay things down. We see it's a serpent. And then he might say, come back to civilization or pick it up again. But now it's the rod of God. You're the rod of God. You're used of God, not for your own pleasure. And so we see uh, the, the, the witness is a, is a place. The wilderness is a place one's delivered from slavery. By the way, it was in the wilderness that God revealed his law to the children of Israel. Remember that? Mount Sinai, wasn't, wasn't that in the wilderness? It's, it's, it's in those places away from the world where, where God is able to speak and reveal He's holy in the world. You don't know He's holy because you're so contaminated by the world. Uh, you no longer blush. But when you get alone with God, you realize how sinful the world is. If you want to know how sinful we are, go on a mission trip for a little bit. Then come back into the United States and you realize, boy, we're so materialistic. Several years ago, I went on a, a trip to Matamoros. We went over to Matamoros, Mexico, and, uh, and uh, was in Mexico. But we went to Matamoros City Dump. I uh, went from the city dump, uh, then came back and went to Kansas City and went in a mall. I kind of got nauseated. After being in a city dump where there's dirt floors and people living in, in uh, uh, wood shanties, you know, uh, uh, eating whatever they can find and, and going through the garbage to get what they can, and that's how they live. They live, they're born, they die in the dump. Then I go back to Kansas City, walk in this big mall, everybody's spending money, you know. You know it kind of makes you nauseous. But, but you don't realize how bad that is till you go into the wilderness for a while. But it's important that you go in the wilderness with God. But it was in the wilderness that God revealed His law. It was, it was in the wilderness where God also established His covenant with the children of Israel. It wasn't, a long, it wasn't in Egypt. It was, it, was, it was out there in the wilderness. God established a covenant. And, and it was in the wilderness uh, that John the Baptist came and calling on people to prepare for Christ's appearance. It's kind of like the old preacher coming out of the woodwork. Where'd that old goat come from? He don't dress like us. He's different than us. He has different standards. I mean, you know, he looks at me, you know, I feel like a sinner. That's good. Because the people have to come to the point where they realize they need a Savior before our Savior can appear to save them. They won't, they won't accept him. And John the Baptist comes out of the wilderness. So in the, in the wilderness, it pictures a return to God's promises, his laws, his plan, and his gospel. And we need to go back to the wilderness. We need to go back to the wilderness to, to focus not on the things of the world, but on the promises of God. Go back to the wilderness to, to focus on God's laws and God's standard of holiness, not the world. Uh, focus on His plan, not our plans of living for pleasure and just enjoying the world while we can. And focus most of all on His gospel purpose. Go there and get changed and come back into society and people will look at us like John the Baptist. Man, he's dressed in, in uh, camel's hair and eating, wild, and eating locusts and, and, and honey. And he's different. Yeah, he's different. He's different because he's been with God. He's not all contaminated by the world. You know, Jesus said there was none greater than John the Baptist. Wow. He's filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb, the Bible says. You know, you say, man, I wish I was John the Baptist. You don't. Because what did they do with him? You know what happened to John the Baptist. You know, his preaching got too personal to the government. Uh, when, he, when he corrected uh, a government leader of having uh, someone else as his wife, it was sin, and a government leader, Herod, put him in prison. And then this girl comes out and dances. And, and he was so pleased. He said, what would you like? She said, I want John's head on a platter. You ever heard the phrase head on a platter? That's where it comes from. So the great prophet John the Baptist was so different from the world. They cut his head off and put it on a platter and, and celebrated it as a celebration. That's what the world thought of John the Baptist. Of course, what did they think of Jesus, right? My point is, the story of the gospel begins with a cry from the wilderness. And Jesus is crying to you today. Come unto me, all ye labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come unto him. Where's he at? He's out. In the, he's not right. He's in the wilderness. He's going to take you somewhere that you've never been before. He's going to take you out of the world, where you will be in the world, but not of the world. Folks, we need to go back to the wilderness. You say, uh, what plan do we need to grow the church? 
Jesus is going to grow his church. We just need to preach and pray, amen, and be persecuted. That's the three Ps of church growth, preaching, praying, and getting persecuted, okay? And the Holy Spirit does the rest, amen? We need to go back to the wilderness to, to not know a program, but to know God, to seek God. And in holiness, he's a, he's a holy God. You know, we, we live in such a day that things are accepted. You know, this behavior is accepted. You know, homosexuality is, is okay. God understands. Living with one another in adultery is fine. God understands. Uh, you know, uh, uh, looking at lewd pictures. Oh, you know, God understands these things. You know, uh, uh, steal a little bit over the talk. God understands these. Listen, God is holy. God is holy. God is, holy means different. He's so far different that when we would see him, if we would see him, we'd fall on our face like uh, Isaiah and say, holy, holy, holy. You know, we'd say, I'm undone. God is, you know, God's holy. And his kingdom's going to be holy. So do you want to go to heaven or do you want to be holy? You know, if, you go, if, you, if you're holy, you're going to heaven. But just because you don't want to go to heaven don't mean you're going to heaven, Okay. The way there is holiness. Well, I don't have any holiness. Jesus is your holiness. Come to Jesus. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Something else. The story of the gospel begins with a call to the wilderness. The cry is from the wilderness. The message is out there. It's different. The gospel is foolishness to the world. John's message was foolishness to the world. It was different. It was going back to this old book archaic book that nobody believes in anymore, but we know to be the truth. Amen? Amen. It's God's word. People try to stop that. But the story of the gospel begins with a call to the wilderness, and it, it says John was baptizing in the wilderness, verse 4. And the Bible says also in verse 5, they were going out to him. He was baptizing, and the word was John was preaching, and people were coming out of the villages out to where John was preaching. They were coming out to hear him. Okay? You say, boy, people don't do that anymore. In other cultures, man, it's dead. Uh, let me tell you something. If, if a church would get on fire for God, and if a church would, would experience the fullness of God, I think people would either come to watch the church burn or come to burn the church. One of the two. Because if you're full of God, people, you're going to attract certain ones, but you're going to attract some because they, they want the message. You attract others because they want to stomp out the message. And we find that the story of the gospel begins with a call to the wilderness. Uh, they were coming out from the world. They were coming to confess and repent of sin. John had a baptism of repentance. The idea is, before you deal with Jesus, you better be serious about your sin problem. Let me say it again. Before you deal with Jesus, we like to deal with Jesus without talking about the sin problem. But if everyone in the Bible, when they come to Jesus, like Peter said, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. Remember that? Okay. And remember the woman at the well? You know, she wanted the, the water that Jesus had. And, and Jesus first said, go, uh, 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 go get your husband. And she said, I have no husband. And Jesus said, you're right, you've had five other husbands. Jesus always wants to deal with the sin problem. And John's baptism was dealing with the sin problem. The sin problem was keeping people from God, but it also keeps people from the gospel. Because if you don't admit you've got a sin problem, how in the world are you going to want to submit to Jesus for any reason? Uh, there's a book several years ago, Whatever Happened to Sin?, we don't call it anymore. We call it affair now. We call it disease now. You know, we call it uh, being born a certain way. You know, uh, a victim, a, a product of your environment. You know, we all have a sin problem. And John the Baptist was preaching a baptism of repentance. Uh, when I was in Israel, we went to out in the desert to where the Essenes, I guess that's how you pronounce it, uh, as people lived in the desert, they wanted to be separate from the world. And John kind of was that kind of a guy because the world contaminated him. He, they wanted to be separate. And they had these, these, these holes in the ground. Looks just like our baptistry. There was a hole with steps going down into the ground. They'd fill those with water and they'd have ceremonial baptisms. This was before the time of Christ. 
Okay, so they practiced. Baptism was a, a ritual of cleansing back then. Okay, uh, and identification as well. And John's baptism was one of identifying. I'm confessing I'm a sin, and I'm, 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 I confess death for my sin, you know, and repentance. Uh, the gospel is, is next. Okay, you repent and you believe, right? Repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance, folks, is not, I'm sorry, I got caught. Repentance is, I've sinned against God, and I deserve the judgment I get. But I'm, my heart no longer wants to participate. Okay, that's true repentance. It's change. Uh, repentance in itself means a change. It means a change of mind, a change of heart, or a change of mind that results in a change in life. You know, change, repent about Jesus means I'm going to uh, change from not believing to what? Believing Him. I'm repenting of my sins. I, I'm changing from uh, uh, enjoying my sin and trusting in my sin to meet my need to trust in God to meet my need. Okay? And, and so John was preaching a baptism of repentance. And uh, uh, the story be, uh, begins with a call from, to the wilderness. And the Lord is calling people today to repent. But now we have the other part of that since Jesus has already come. Repent and believe. Amen. And today we practice believer's baptism, which means that I die with Christ and now I live with him. Okay. It means that he is my death. He paid for my sins. And now he's my Lord. Baptism also should be accompanied with a confession. You know, in the uh, early church, confessions were made. You know, and the confession is, you know, I'm going to follow Jesus. He's Lord. I'm going to follow him the rest of my life. It's a, it's a commitment from real repentance. You know, they asked Peter on the day of Pentecost, what must we do? He said, repent and be baptized. And what's he mean? What's he saying? That repent means change your mind about Jesus and, and realize that you crucified Jesus. You, you sinned in doing that and, and, and you, you turn away from thinking that way. Repent and be baptized means I'm now turning from sin of unbelief and I'm embracing Jesus as my Lord. And that day, 3,000 people did that. It's kind of strange as, as, as preparing this message. And I say, for us to be a Baptist church, we're the most unbaptistic people around. Not us as a church, but Baptist. Baptist, you know, we're called Baptist because we baptize. You know, right? You know, and, and why is it in Baptist churches we don't baptize a whole lot? We we're Baptist. We're known as the Baptist, but why are we baptizing? At a doctoral seminar, we were asked, well, how would we design a church with the purpose of baptism? And my idea was to have a big pool right in the middle of the church. Full all the time. Or out here on the street corner. Okay. Public. Okay. Where, where it was always ready. You say, preacher, that's Church of Christ. No, it's not Church of Christ. Church of Christ believes baptism saves you. We don't believe that it's a baptism that saves you. It's Jesus that saves you. Now, Church of Christ will argue with that. It's really Jesus. But we won't get into that this morning, okay? That's another day. But the, the, the fire idea, if we just had the enthusiasm for baptism that the Church of Christ has, you know, we'd really be Baptist, wouldn't we? Okay? And uh, because baptism is important, isn't it? Isn't it important? But yet, we try to make it so, I don't know, we make it hard for people to be baptized. Repent and believe and be baptized, right? And confess Christ. And so... We're not going to put a pool here next week, but uh, just a thought, you know. Instead of being way back here in the corner, maybe it needs to be out on the, well, here's Iowa. It gets cold in the winter, right? I like to be out public where, we, you know. Anyone that's baptized in a creek? Anybody baptized in a river? Yeah. Uh, baptized in a river? I baptized in a rock quarry one time. Went out two feet, and I was up to here. That was close enough. <laughs> okay. That's all I mean. It was at Worthington, by the way. Just to let you know. But any, anyway, uh, uh, Baptism. But John's call was bad. People were going out to repent and be baptized. They were repenting of their sin. They, the Messiah's going away. I want to be ready. I'm confessing I'm a sinner. And, but the problem was, is many of the people were thinking that the Messiah to come uh, was going to make the other nations confess their sins against Israel. They thought the Messiah to come was going to whip up the other nations good for mistreating them. They thought the Messiah to come was going to... They could, I was right. 
But no, the Messiah that was to come was going to say, you sin, Israel. You get right. They missed the whole purpose of the Messiah coming. And so, therefore, they didn't want to hear that message. What, I have to repent? What do I have to repent of? I'm Jew. I'm born a Jew. I try to keep the law. I'm going to heaven. I'm not a sinner. Those other people are sinners. But John the Baptist was preaching repentance. Because he wanted them to prepare to receive Jesus. And by the way, when we preach law around here, we're trying for people to prepare to receive Jesus. you got to be a sinner before you can be saved. You have to understand that. Amen? And you who are saved, you shouldn't mind us preaching a little law that makes you feel like you're going to hell because you know you're not because you're trusting Jesus. Makes you feel like you're taking a bath when you've been to church. Right? Yeah, the preacher threw the dirt on you, then he washed it off, okay? But that's, 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 the John was preaching this. Something else, and we'll be through this morning. The story of the gospel begins with Christ in the wilderness. Not only is there a cry from the wilderness, but there's a, uh, there's a call to the wilderness, but we find Christ in the wilderness. It says in those days, uh, Jesus went out and was baptized in the Jordan River, the wilderness. Now, why was he baptized? Did he need to be baptized? Jesus is perfect. He's sinless. He didn't need to confess any sin, but he was identifying with John's ministry. That's one purpose of baptism. Also, he was fulfilling all righteousness. Jesus uh, fulfilled the law in every point. And God expect people to be baptized? Jesus got baptized. As an example, and he fulfilled all righteousness. You with me now? And he identified with John's ministry. And, and what happened when he was baptized? The Bible says the heavens opened. And, and you look at the Greek, did the heavens split open? Or I'm not sure. Or is it like the clouds split open? We're not sure what happened. But, but the Holy Spirit descended upon him as a dove. Okay. And I'm sure that was a testimony to the fact that that. This, when John saw him, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world from the other gospel. But Jesus begins by going and identifying with the ministry that's in the wilderness. Jesus is all about getting away from the world. Amen? Amen. Jesus is all about holiness. Jesus is setting the example. He's, showing, he's getting baptized because baptism is showing one who surrendered totally to God. We all get baptized, but we fall short. Guess what? Jesus did not fall short. He baptized. He was baptized. He was showing us a commitment. It was the inauguration, I guess you could say, of his public ministry. He was baptized. The Holy Spirit came upon him and the people, and there was a voice from God. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Well, you notice Mark is writing to all the readers. There's a voice from heaven. This is my beloved son. In whom I'm all pleased, all well pleased. You know, it's, it's a message that Jesus is the Son of God. That's why his opening statement is, in those days, or Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God announces it from heaven. Mark writes it down for all to read. And everything else in Jesus' life proved he was and is the Son of God. And so Jesus was baptized. But then what happens after he's baptized? He's got the Holy Spirit. Now, let me tell you something. When Jesus lived on earth, he lived under the direction of the Holy Spirit as an example for us. We're to live under the direction of the Holy Spirit, right? We're not Jesus, but he lived the life of a human. No, he's God. He lived by being led of the Spirit. And today, you can live by being led of the Spirit. But look at verse 12. The Spirit immediately after you're baptized. Now, after you get baptized, you guys want a certificate, want everybody to hug you, maybe go out and eat, celebrate your baptism, right? After Jesus was baptized, the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. We got work to do. When you get baptized, you know, instead of celebrating the glory, man, the heavens opened up. The dove descended. Well, if that happened to you, you'd be writing a book about it. You wouldn't be doing anything but writing a book and lecturing on it. But immediately the, the Spirit of God drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. Wow. Jesus has been in the wilderness. He was tempted. 
And he was with the wild animals. Remember me telling you about the people throwing the wild animals in Rome? He was with the wild animals. So what Mark is saying, Jesus has experienced the wilderness for everybody. Now, the children of Israel were in the wilderness 40 years. What did they do? They failed, right? Adam was tempted by the devil. We're not sure how long, but what happened to him? He failed. But Jesus went out for 40 days in the wilderness, and he defeated Satan. He did not yield. He did what Israel or Adam could do. The second Adam endured the wilderness and all it had for us. And the ideal for us today is Jesus is your Lord and Savior even in your wilderness he wants you to be in the wilderness, but he'd be there with you because he's been there. And, and this message to the people in Rome, Mark's recipients. You know, here Jesus was in all this, and he conquered, and they killed him, but he arose from the dead. Therefore, I can be faithful, and I have my reward, and I will have vindication someday. And the last point I want us to mention this morning is simple this. Has the story of the gospel began in you? This is about the story of the gospel. It began with a cry from the wilderness. Come here. It begins with a call from the wilderness. Come, be baptized. Christ is calling you to him. It begins with Christ in the wilderness. Where are you going to find Christ? You will find Christ not in the lights of Las Vegas. You'll find Christ in the wilderness. Out aside. Now, I'm not saying you can't find him in Las Vegas. But you won't find him at the casino table. Focusing on gambling. But you will find him on your knees by the casino table. Leaving that. Trusting Christ alone. Jesus is the gospel. Amen. He's the good news. And as we look at this first few verses of Mark. The message I want you to, to stay with you is Christ can be found in the wilderness. And the call of God is to come out with him in the wilderness. And by the way, if you're following the Lord as you should, if your heart's on the things of heaven, if your affections are on things above, this world should feel not like home to you, but should feel like a wilderness, doesn't it? It should. Why are you so at home in the world? It should feel like a wilderness. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's golden shore, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. Boy, I like that song, don't you? Let's pray. Father, I pray that each of us, Lord, would take a trip to the wilderness to do business with you. Surrender to the Lord Jesus and realize that those who feel like they're in the wilderness, that you're there too. Lord, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Help us to surrender afresh to him and have revival. As we begin Bible school week, help us to remember the gospel of Jesus Christ. As we teach the kids and lead them, lead them toward the truth of the gospel that they might be saved. May someone here this morning who don't know you, may they come and receive you publicly by confessing you publicly this morning. For the rest of us, help us to purpose, maybe as John preached, uh, repentance. We repent and turn back to you in the wilderness about your business and your agenda. In Jesus' name, amen.